Uh, my name is Joan Balk. I'm one of the Leonard, uh, one of the librarians at the Leonardtown Library in St. Mary's County. And thank you all for signing on. I would like to introduce Dr. James Gibb. A lot of you know him as Jim. He is currently the, per, the director of the Smithsonian Environmental Archaeology Institute up in Annapolis. He's joining us from Annapolis, and a lot of you know him as Jim, so we're thrilled to have everyone here. Tonight we're going to be talking about the cheese factories. I'm very excited for this program. I can't wait to hear what the archaeology of cheese is. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Jim start. There are a few things though. Um, please keep your microphone muted. If you would like to keep your camera on, that's great. Uh, Jim is very uh, willing to answer questions during the program. So if there's a question that you don't want to wait till the end with, go ahead and just, um, you know, butt in and say, excuse me, Jim's fine with you asking questions. And otherwise you can type your questions into the chat. And at the end of the program, I will go through and read all of them. So with that, uh, take it away, Jim. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, some of you may actually have picked on this trend of me talking about work that is not unconventional, but sort of out of the mainstream, you know, some of the sites I deal with. And this is one of my favorite ones, uh, a cheese factory in central New York. Uh, no one had ever excavated one before, and I don't think anybody has excavated one since. Uh, you know, we'll find out. Um, so that's the subject for tonight. And I do have a couple of published papers on this, uh, which I'm happy to share probably, you know, perhaps through Joan or you can contact me directly. I could send you the PDFs. Uh, they're written for um, people with a similar interest, uh, which is odd because you wouldn't think anybody would have a similar interest in the archeology span of cheese. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, I, of all of my academic work, uh, the Cheese Factory uh, piece is the most widely read for reasons I don't understand. Anyway, I'm going to uh, share my screen and we'll get going. Come on, you can do it. There we go. All right. So, I'm going to start off with, uh, I divide this up into a series of sections just to make it a little more digestible, if you will. Uh, first of all, just talking about where cheese manufacturing started and where it wound up. Uh, a lot of folks, not so much down in Maryland, it's kind of hot around here to be making cheese. Uh, the key season is more or less April, May through October. Uh, but up in the uh, Northeastern United States, including Pennsylvania and the Northern Midwest, uh, a lot of folks certainly would make, a lot of farmers would make their own butter. And that was kind of true around here too. And they make 100, 200 pounds of butter and that would pretty much fill the household needs for the year, which may have you grasping your chest right now because 200 pounds of butter in one year may sound like a lot. Uh, but it wasn't. Uh, butter was used in everything. Um, and some households, cheese making requires a bit more skill and more time. Uh, but those households that make cheese would make four, five, six hundred pounds a year, which would be enough for household use and maybe a little bit to sell. But that started to change. Uh, and it the way it changes, you know, you can have 10 cows that you're milking and you can make cheese out of. Uh, just at a household level, but more than that, you really need more people in a bigger facility. Uh, this is a photograph, I, I think it's from um, uh, Wisconsin, but I think what we've got here is a building. Uh, let me get my pointer going here. This is the cheese factory, and I think this is the house they lived in. So this is a rather small affair. I think this is an early attempt at uh, mass producing uh, cheese using milk provided by neighboring dairy farms. Jim, if you're sharing your slides, I can't see them. I don't know if anybody else can. Can everybody see them? I can see them fine. 
I can see you, Ray. I, 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 I did something stupid, I'm sure. <laughs> Can you can you see the P, all of the other attendees? I, I see everybody. Yeah. Why don't you go to the upper right hand corner where it says view or something like that and turn off all of our images? Right. Maybe that'll help. If not, what I suggest you do is sign out and then sign back in again. I don't know what else to do. Okay. All right. Don't worry about me. I'll figure it out. Okay. If, if you sign out, Ray, I'll let you back in. Don't. Um, so anyway, this is what's going on uh, between uh, the early 1850s and up to just a little past the Civil War. Cheese factories really didn't exist uh, prior to the 1840s, and they were very few and far between up until up through the late 1850s. But right around 1860, 1861, a movement started where um, uh, an entrepreneur would hire a cheesemaker, sometimes a woman, sometimes a man, uh, somebody experienced in making cheese. And by the way, for the most part, we're talking about cheddar, uh, not the other cheeses. So they get somebody who knows what they're doing. They hire a couple of people to help out. And then what they do is they get a bunch of farmers, neighboring farmers to deliver their milk every day or every couple of days make the cheese, and then when that's done, they give the cheese back to the farmers, keeping a certain percent for themselves, and then they ship the stuff off to usually urban markets along the East Coast. So you can see here in this graph, it just rockets, a huge spike. And mind you, this graph just shows you new factories each year. It doesn't tell you how many factories are actually in operation. Uh, Joan, uh, Ray's trying to get in. I don't think I can. Oh, I guess I can admit him. Uh, so this, does, this doesn't tell us how many cheese factories in operation. By 1870, I think there was something like 1,700 cheese factories across just the state of New York. So it became quite an industry. What prompted it? Partly uh, the Civil War, where they needed... Uh, uh, food that would preserve, and cheese, cheddar cheese, preserves fairly well. Uh, but also in England uh, and throughout Great Britain, there was a, uh, a drought, a bit of a famine, and also a change in the gold standard. So all of a sudden, cheese became a very uh, remunerative export to the UK. There are probably other things involved, too, I won't go into. And look at this graph here. I won't show you a lot of graphs, but you could see 1850s, 1859, 1860, 1861, all of a sudden cheese export, tons of cheese, even during the Civil War, when you think we'd be using this for our soldiers, just starts shooting up and just rockets in the 1870s. So there's clearly a demand for the product. And why all this is interesting is that so much of certainly central New York state, but also other states started remolding their economies, focusing on dairy cattle and fodder for dairy cattle to produce milk for these cheese factories, putting all of their eggs in the proverbial one basket. This map shows uh, in 1849, uh, where cheese is being produced in the household. This is farm cheese, this is not factory cheese. And you can see here in New York, you know, really got hot spots over here, Western New York, Central New York, which includes the area I'm gonna be talking about this evening, and then up, up um, in the Northern part of the state, uh, around uh, Watertown and, and such places. And of course, along the Hudson River too. And each of those dots represents 10,000 pounds, you know, five tons of cheese. But that's small compared to what the factory started making 20 years later. And these factories, you know, they're small. Uh, this is actually, well, it was a relatively new one when I visited about, I don't know, 35 years ago. Um, and this is actually probably a mill, a grist mill that was converted into a cheese factory. I don't remember where it is in Vermont, except that it's right across the road from where the Calvin Coolidge homestead is. But I actually, I got 
an opportunity. One of the employees toured me around the building and then her boss came in. <laughs> he wasn't happy. Anyway, here we got New York cheese factories in 1899. And you can still see the same concentration, Western New York, Central New York, and up uh, in the Watertown area, and a little bit and pretty negligible along the, the uh, uh, Hudson River. And the thing is, this is not even at the uh, apex of cheese factories, which was probably about 10 years earlier. At this point, it's actually a bit of a decline, but it's 50 years from the last map. And then here's New York cheese factories 50 years after that, uh, rapid decline. So you can see we start out with home production, then these small factories, uh, and then those small factories are around for less than half a century. And pretty much they all disappear. You could still see some of these if you know what you're looking for driving around central New York. Not only do we have, um, growth in cheese factories, but all of a sudden we get these companies that started producing stuff as, as suppliers for cheese factories. So for instance, this Hanson scale on the right, those were produced specifically for the dairy industry. And as you'll see, as I go through and talk about how we make, you know, how cheddar cheese is made, you can see there's all kinds of implements that are needed. Thermometers, large vats, metal vats, uh, cream separators, all sorts of equipment. So there are companies that just sort of mushroom, especially in Rome and Utica, New York, providing these materials to local cheesemakers. All right, making cheese. This is the best part. How do you make cheddar cheese? I was very fortunate when doing this work, um, when excavating this cheese factory, to have found in Harper's new monthly magazine, 19, uh, 1874, 1875, I don't recall the date offhand, but there was actually an extended article on how you make cheese. And the next several illustrations come from that, uh, those articles. If you go into any decent university research library, they have these things on the shelves. It wasn't a special order. So here we have a farm boy uh, delivering milk to a cheese factory you notice it's being winched up and he's pouring it into a vat inside the building through a window. And the person on the inside is kind of androgynous. It could be a woman, could be a man. The early days of cheese factories, it really could have been either uh, because women were the experienced cheese makers. As this involved more and more money, men sort of muscled their way into the business. But this would have been typical each day uh, or every couple of days, you bring a wagon load, you keep it cool at your farm, then you bring the milk to the cheese factory, empty it into this large container. So this is the milk being dumped through the window. The scale is probably a little off. Nobody can lift the bucket that big. But they're pouring it into this large bin that's sitting on a, a scale, um, which also became a big industry at the time. Fairbanks uh, scales up in Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Hobart, uh, I think, in Ohio. Uh, so they're pouring it in. What they're doing is they're weighing the milk. Milk is not measured by volume. It's measured by weight because you could easily put a lot of water in your milk to increase the volume. But when you weigh it, you'd realize that, you know, clearly this milk has been watered down. And in fact, they, uh, a number of tests were developed to measure butter fat in milk and also make sure it wasn't adulterated. Obviously putting water in milk is not gonna make cheese. And that's what the fellow on the left is doing. I think this is, uh, he's testing butter fat content with probably a Babcock uh, butter tester. So the stuff is weighed and they write down how much the farmer brought in and then it's conveyed to another room and notice these rooms are kept separate and you know really tight. There are not a lot of doors, and even the windows are let let in light, but probably was seldom open. With dairy products, milk really absorbs odors, and so and it's easy to get dirt in. So what you want to do is keep these places immaculately clean, and avoid oil, uh, odors. You wouldn't, for instance, have a cheese factory next to a pig farm; that would be disastrous. 
So the milk is conveyed to these large vats here. And into these vats, they'll warm the milk. And then they will put in a little bit of what's called rennet. It's an enzyme. And this enzyme comes from the, the linings of calf uh, uh, stomachs. So when a calf is butchered, they save the stomach lining, they dry it out, and then uh, I imagine I crush it up and add it to a little bit of water or whatever before putting it in. And that enzyme co causes the curds to form and it, it, it uh, releases the fats and proteins from the lactose, uh, from the whey. So what they're doing at this point is, you see they've got this drain here. What they're doing is they're decanting the whey and it's leaving the building. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with whey. Certainly those of us who aren't from farm backgrounds probably have little exposure to it. But whey is um, kind of a nasty yellowish color. Looks kind of dirty. I think it tastes terrible. Um, however, whey is about 90% by weight of milk. So if you're making cheese, you're going to get 90% waste. Now, whey can be turned into regatta, uh, which is great for lasagna, cocconi stufati, making cannoli, all right, very popular today. Back in the mid 19th century, not so much. A lot of that whey was simply dumped into local creeks. So that's 90% of the weight of this stuff is being discarded. That's the way they did it. To give you a sense of what it looks like, this is a more modern picture of a um, curd vat. And at this point, the whey has been removed. And what they've done is, the, once you put the enzyme in, the rennet, it, it, the curds come together. It looks like a block of tofu, if you're familiar with that. And then they will take these large knives and cut that block of curd into lots of small pieces, increasing the surface area. And that allows the whey to escape. And at this point in this photograph, what they've done is they've trained off the whey. And this is the result in curds. Uh, again, a, a relatively more recent photograph, probably 1940s. What these guys are doing is they've, they had a large piece of cloth in this vat and all the milk was on top of it. Well, after they've, uh, the curds have formed, they're using this winch to sort of gather up the curds. And what they're gonna do is swing it around back to this large hoop here. And they're gonna dump those curds in there and then put this wooden cover or head on it. And we'll see where that goes next. So here it is on a smaller scale, more traditional type um, curd vat. And you can see this guy's pouring the curds into this hoop that's lined with cheesecloth. It doesn't really pour, you know, the artists didn't have a really good idea how this works. It's not that liquid. Stuff kind of slurped and slobbered into uh, the uh, hoop. And then once they filled it up, he's gonna pull the cheesecloth over the top, put a wooden head on it, turn it vertically, give it to this guy, and he's gonna stick it into this large screw press, which is a lot like um, the tobacco prize in Southern Maryland. It's a screw actuated thing. And you just crank it up and, uh, and a piston sort of pushes all these together and squeezes them. So the curds form uh, a block, if you will, and at the same time, squeeze out the excess whey. And this, this is an example of what these hoops look like and the heads that go on them. They're only temporary because what they're gonna do then is they're gonna take those big wheels of cheese and they're gonna bring them into the curing room, which is nice and tight. Again, it's got windows so you get light in there, but there's not a lot of air moving through. And they will remove the wooden hoops and the heads. So it's just a big hunk of curd wrapped in cheesecloth. And then what they'll do every day is they'll wipe off the whey that sort of sweats out of it and they'll flip it over each wheel, wipe it again, and the next day they'll do the same thing. So the cheese is aging, partly by expressing whey and partly be, you know, through the action of the uh, um, 
uh, microbes that are in there. And they'll keep doing this for you know, maybe six months until you get a nice piece of, of cheddar cheese. Then these wheels are covered with wax and they're shipped off. They, they withstand transportation quite nicely. And you, most of it gets shipped to uh, urban markets. If you go uh, up to New England, you can still go into supermarkets and get a oh, little Oh, it must be a couple pound wheels of cheese covered in black plastic. It really is the best. It's still covered in plastic, so when you remove that plastic, the cheese is fresh. Unlike the stuff you buy in the store that's all been chopped up uh, and tends to dry out and the shredded cheese uh, dries out. Uh, if you can find a wheel of cheese covered in plastic like this, you're gonna have some good cheese. So let's get back you know, to the actual site that uh, my colleagues and I excavated back in, I think around 1987. Um, it's in a place called Columbus Center, and I'll show you where that is in a moment. And I've just provided a brief history of who ran this place. It was a couple of uh, partners named Nicholas Richer and Henry Holmes, of which you'll hear more in a moment. Uh, and then uh, Henry Holmes dropped out of the partnership and George Whitmore joined. And then the pair of them sold to basically the Sage family. And they uh, ended up just closing the place in 1904, but it was around for 40 years. Um, each of these cheesemakers, these partnerships, when they wanted to expand production, they didn't make the factory bigger. There was no point because they were already bringing in all the milk that could be readily transported uh, in the course of a day. So if you were more than say two and a half miles from a cheese factory, you weren't gonna be bringing your milk in. It was just too far. So what these guys did to expand production was they'd simply buy up neighboring cheese factories. Um, and that did create a problem that I'll get to a little in a few minutes. So here's, here's the area we're talking about. New York State is here. Shenango County is more or less in the center of New York State, and Columbus Center is a little village up in the northeast corner of it. For those of you who don't know the area, it's very different from around here. Every couple of miles on the road, you'll find a hamlet. Every five miles or so, you'll find a little town. Uh, quite charming places as a rule. Uh, not the kind of rural setting that we had down here. Here we have an 1855 map of Columbus and the area in question where this factory is, was is right here, but it, it didn't exist in 1855, so it doesn't show up on the map. What we have on the other side of the creek is a tannery. The two of them would not coincide. You cannot have any kind of dairy operation near a tannery because tanneries smell really, really bad. So I circled a couple of other things on here. Whitmore up here. A uh, house of Nicholas Richer over here, and a Holmes. Actually, a couple more Richers around in Holmes's, but you can see the original partners in this operation were all local. They were neighbors, they knew one another. This is not a case of outside capital coming in. In 1875, we have a map of Columbus zoomed out a little bit, and here the cheese factory actually shows up. It's hard to see here because we have a Mill Pond, uh, but it says Cheese Fact right here. That's the Cheese Factory on the left side of Center Brook. And here's the, the town of Columbus. Have a detailed, yeah, close up view of that so you could see it a little bit better. So, this is kind of setting we're dealing with. Now, this is central New York. It's fairly rural, quite rural, really. Uh, it's agricultural. Uh, but here's a 1912 map of what that area looks like, uh, which among other things shows where the cheese factory would have been, but it is now gone in 1912. Look at the contours here, look at the topography. This was hilly, a very hilly area, uh, unsuited to field agriculture like wheat, corn, stuff like that. It was really good for livestock, particularly sheep, and dairy cattle, beef cattle too, I, I suppose. So that's part of the attraction here. This area was well suited to dairy and sheep farming. 
Uh, I don't have a photograph or any kind of image of Elsie Whitmore. Uh, typically women, uh, we have trouble finding portraits of women in 19th century. But this is her on a gravestone underneath her husband. Elsie Whitmore, born 1802, died 1888. She's interesting for the story for two purposes. Number one, she had a son named George Whitmore, who in 1864 was a carpenter. Uh, when this portrait was done was decades later when he was a fairly prominent businessman in New York City, a commission merchant who specialized in rural produce and particularly cheese and butter. The other reason Elsie Whitmore is important is because she wrote a diary. And in 1864, she talks about how Nicholas Richer and Henry Holmes, her neighbors, hired her son, George, a carpenter, to build a cheese factory. That's what makes her really important for this story. And this is the cheese factory right here in front. And this is the town of Columbus out behind here. This photo, this is from a postcard, dates to 1908. Look at the windows. There are no sashes in the windows. This building has been abandoned and it's being cannibalized for material. Actually sort of an interesting story about how we found this postcard image of the factory. Uh, my colleague Dave Bernstein and I, we went just down the road into town here and sat down in the dining room of the town historian, whose name escapes me at the moment. We sat in her dining room for about two hours drinking, I don't know how many cups of coffee. All the time, she insisted that she didn't know anything about the cheese factory, other than she knew there was a cheese factory around. After almost two hours, she says, excuses herself, gets up for a moment, and not 60 seconds later, comes back into the room with this postcard. And you, it's hard to see it up here, but it says, uh, view of Columbus old cheese and old cheese factory. Not only was she able to put her hands on this in seconds, but she said, oh yeah, and my father bought the place and disassembled it for material, which he used to build the barn. It's still just up the road from here. And the lesson here is that when doing local work, it really takes a while to build uh, trust with people. Uh, in this case, two hours. And actually it took more like two or three years because several years afterwards, after publishing the first piece on this thing, she um, sent to the public archeology span facility where I was working. And my friend there sent the copy to me of the TypeScript of Elsie Whitmore's journal, which describes building this, cutting the wood, uh, citing the ice house and deciding they wanted to move it, you know, all sorts of great detail. Uh, so it really took quite a while to build trust with just that one person, but it paid off and we've got some great stuff. So Jim, excuse me for a second. So do you, did she know all along that the cheese factory was there? She knew everything. <laughs> Why, why would she feel that she couldn't share that with you? Well, we run into uh, this a lot with local historians and genealogists. Sometimes they're very possessive of what they have. It's hard to get them to share. Huh. Uh, often because they have ideas of publishing this stuff, even uh -huh. though very often they don't really know how to go about that other than self-publishing. And she, she did, she did uh, self-publish, if you will. She ran photocopies of the diary, of Elsie Whitmore's diary eventually. But um, and this is a constant problem we run into doing local research. That's interesting. So here you have our excavation, and I use the term excavation rather loosely. Um, you know, you can see a foundation emerging here. Uh, Maybe it, it would help if I discuss the other side of the creek first. You see this area over here, it's all kind of dark and it's level, it's like a parking lot. Those are cinders from the town incinerator, from burning trash for many years. 
and probably coal ash from local households as well, dumped on the other side of the creek where actually the tannery was in 1855. That same kind of material was dumped on this site too. So when we were excavating it, we were really just shoveling off the, the cinders. There really wasn't any digging kind of archeology span to do, uh, trenching around the foundations a little bit to uh, highlight them. But basically this was just covered by cinders. Uh, a couple of my friends and I, while we were working on it, uh, exposing one of the foundations. Uh, all of this was mapped uh, by hand and then with uh, a transit. That's me off in the background, a youthful 28 or so, I think. And this is one of the rooms, just to give you an idea of what we're finding. So we've got a well-defined foundation, right? And in this case, we have a lot of rubble fill, no cell or anything, just rubble fill. And if you look at the sides of the excavation, you can see we didn't really excavate anything. We just pulled back the grass. This is more like weeding than it is uh, archeological excavation. Uh, and this part, at this point, we've, ex we've exposed just a part of this particular room. We also found, you can see on the left, this terracotta pipe which continues in the image on the right-hand side. And there's a uh, elbow joint and it's fixed in the ground with a bunch of concrete. And so it, it, uh, the pipes extended from there out of that room across another room. And we never found the end, but presumably it led out to Center Brook, the creek. This is for the way. All the, you know, 90% of weight of milk brought to this place was whey. And it was simply drained out of the facility and into the local creek. Uh, this is a practice that continued with larger, more modern factories through the 1960s. With the passage of the Clean Water Act, a lot of these places had to shut down because I mean, it was just terrible pollution. You'll also notice that with this terracotta pipe here, you see that sheet metal there? That's been patched. At some point, that, that pipe was broken. And so what they did was they just patched it over with some sheet metal. So that's maintenance. And we see little bits of maintenance around the building. There's no evidence whatsoever of expansion. Remember I said, there's no point in expanding one of these factories because you can only raise so many milk cows in the area. Another view of that patch, and I point it out here too, is because I don't have a photograph of it, but right around that patch, we found, I don't know, five or six liquor bottles. And I mean, it's, it's important because if you know anything about this period, let's Sally in here. If you know anything about this period um, from the mid 19th century into the early 20th century, temperance was a big thing in, in New York. If you did not sign the pledge, if you did not swear that you would uh, forego all alcohol, you were pretty much ostracized. Uh, a lot of these communities, their social life organized around uh, temperance society meetings. And that led to, of course, that momentous uh, passage of a certain amendment to our constitution that provided the basis for laws against the production sale of uh, drinking alcohol, which mercifully lasted only 13 years. Uh, it is actually the only amendment to the constitution that affected citizens, specifically targeted citizens' behavior, as opposed to telling government what it could and could not do. The image on the left is a water pipe and you can see a fixture at one end. So obviously they need water here, but again, with cheese, you don't add water. You do need the water to keep everything immaculately clean. And that's what that was all about. And in fact, going back to this photograph, the 1908 photograph, you can see I've got it circled. That's a hand pump for water. That's, that's what that water pipe is connected to. And it is outside the building, not inside. This is ultimately what we found in terms of foundations. Uh, this, we just picked up a corner of it here. I mean, we couldn't excavate this thing in its entirety, but this would have been uh, the weighing room. This is where milk would be delivered. Uh, well, actually the weighing room would be here. This would, uh, uh, be the curd room, sorry. We didn't pick up the weighing room, but this would be the curd room. You could see that drain pipe leading out 
connected to the adjoining structure. This would be uh, where the curds were pressed. And this is where the cheeses would be cured in this room here. We have our water pipe here. So the pump would have been right about here. We have a bit of a retaining wall. Over here, we have part of a foundation for what we're pretty sure was uh, the butter making part of the facility. Initially, they just made cheese. Uh, but and we're not sure exactly when. We know by 1892, but we don't know when they started. They were making butter as well. So they, the milk would be brought, they'd skim off the cream, use that to make butter, and then the uh, rest of the whole milk would be used to make cheese. And also kind of interesting, we've got this sort of almost concrete pavement over here. That was a milk receiving station that people actually remember. After the factory closed down, farmers who live close enough would bring cans of milk to the receiving station where they'd be loaded on a motorized truck, which would then take them to Sherburne, a much larger town uh, about 10 miles down the road. So here again is our historic photograph. We've got the way room here, which we didn't find any archeological trace of, but chances are it was setting on wooden post anyway, it wouldn't have left much of a mark. We have the uh, curd and pressing room here. And then in the background, we have the curing room. So I just uh, want to spend a moment, talk a little bit about what the effects of these cheese factories had on the local economy. And this is what you know, really interests me a great deal. Uh, in this graph from 1850 to 1880, you can see livestock production, swine, you know, it varies a little bit, but it's fairly low. Cow production, dairy cattle rise fairly significantly, but not usually so because there's just so many dairy cattle that a household could manage without the technology we have today. Look what happens to sheep production in 1850. It just plummets by 1860 and stays at a very low level actually throughout the rest of the 19th century. This part of New York, folks, uh, farmers practice more or, less, more or less mixed agriculture. So they have some dairy cattle, they have a bunch of sheep for pr producing wool, they grow some corn, they grow some wheat, potatoes, et cetera. It's very uh, diversified. With the development of these cheese factories, farmers got more and more into raising dairy cattle and food for dairy cattle and produced a lot less of other things. Which Kim, where where do you find information like this? Where are all their records? Well, a good source that's available for Maryland too is the federal census. You know, when you say you talk about the federal census, which they were just releasing data today, actually, you think of the population schedules, which tell you, you know, by household, who's in a household, their ages and stuff like that. But there are other schedules to the census. There's uh, mortality schedules, you know, who died in the past year and from what. Uh, there are industrial schedules in each census district, what kinds of factories were there, what kinds of shops that manufactured goods, blacksmith shops, wagon shops, cotton and uh, textile factories, that sort of thing. But another one which is really useful are the agricultural schedules. So every 10 years from 1850 through 1880, they don't survive from 1890 because they burned up in the Department of Commerce. Uh, but even in the early 20th century, the first few decades, we have agricultural schedules that list every single farm in an election district. And it tells us whose farm is it? Do they own it? Do they rent it? Uh, how many acres improved? How many acres unimproved? How many dairy cattle? How many bushels of wheat did they harvest? All this, kind, all this information is fabulous. Um, the neat thing about the state of New York is they did their own census on the odd years, every fifth year. So 1835, 1815, I think is the earliest. But with the agricultural data from 18, maybe 1845, but certainly 1855, 65, 75, and 85. So we have it not just every 10 years, but every five years. And that's what this data comes from. Okay. Um, and it's really important from an historical and anthropological perspective because you have all these farmers who start focusing their emphasis 
on a single product, milk. And that puts them in a precarious position. This chart shows you household produced dairy products, not factory, but what, what are they doing in the farms? And particularly for the most part, what are the women doing? And you can see uh, with butter production, it kind of waggles around a little bit, but uh, it's relatively constant. But cheese production just plummets. It starts plummeting in the 1850s. Over the 1860s, it virtually disappears and really doesn't come back. Cheese, uh, farm-based cheese production effectively ends and has never come back. Fluid milk production, on the other hand, from 1870 to 1880, rises, not surprisingly, because they're selling the milk to the cheese factories. And uh, in the 20th century, more and more of that milk uh, is, goes not to cheese factories, because by about 1910, most of those cheese factories closed. And what farmers are doing is they're actually bringing cans of milk to these stations um, in the early 20th century to start motoring them over where they're loaded onto a truck and then brought to uh, a rail station where they get on the milk train. Some of you may have heard that phrase, the milk train. You know, it's special trains that ran every, well, five, six days a week and stopped every couple of miles to pick up cans of milk. And this is the remains of one of those milk stations. We know that because the local folks told us. And that milk would be transported in cans like these. Um, these were really popular in the 70s, right around the bicentennial actually. People were uh, collecting these milk cans and they often painted them or put decals on them. My own family had one actually, um, sort of celebrating you know, rural Americana. Uh, ironically, these were actually evidence of the rural areas being industrialized. They really involved in industrial milk production, shipping it out in cans before cheese factories developed and certainly before fluid milk was being shipped out of the area, these would not have been uh, needed. Um, I'll talk just very briefly about design. I don't want to really get back to what's happened to these cheese factories. So here's our Columbus Center one. This is one in uh, Wisconsin, and you'll notice it's set up pretty much the same way. You have this winch over here that lifts milk out of wagons and allows you to easily pour it into a vat on the other side through a window. This place has doors, it has other windows that are open and cattywampus in this case here. By and large, this room and the rest of the factory would be closed up pretty tight because again, you wanna keep out odors, you wanna keep out dirt and dust, Remember, these aren't, um, these aren't um, uh, paved roads, uh, so dust is a real problem. So they really did their best to sort of keep that out by keeping these buildings very tight. And another example from the same region, again, at one end they have a winch and an open window. This place has even fewer windows here indoors. Uh, and then this would be the rest of the factory here. There isn't a problem with having doors and windows. It's a matter of keeping them tight and keeping them closed when at critical periods when that milk is being processed. And the last one, which looked a little bit, a lot like the uh, previous one, again, a winch out here, basically curd room, and then uh, presumably this is where the cheeses would be cured. Farmers just you know, bring their uh, milk in on wagons. Okay, the decline, 1890s to 1910s. I'm gonna, don't read this, I'll read it to you. This is a quote, quotation from the secretary of the Utica Board of Trade, Utica's in central New York, Benjamin Gilbert. I quote, in the valleys of Stockbridge and Chenango, I could tell you of a dozen factories, which two years ago, that is around 1896, produced from one half to a ton per day, but which the railroad companies have bought up, turned the key in the door, and have said to the dairymen, bring your milk to the station, we are not going to run this factory, end quote. Remember when I was talking about the partnerships, when they wanted to expand production or increase product, what they did was they simply bought up more cheese factories. 
So a lot of these cheese factories were in the hands of relatively few people. It was an easy thing for the railroads to come along and then buy up those chains of cheese factories and just close them, shut them down. And the reason they were doing this is they wanted to ship the milk to large urban markets for which they would charge whatever rates they damn well pleased. Uh, this was a sore point with a lot of people, a lot of farmers. Now, the problem with bringing fluid milk to the railroad station is that, you know, these aren't bus stops. You know, rail railroad stations, you have to be somewhere along the railroad line. If you were more than two and a half, maybe three miles from a railroad station, you couldn't bring your milk. You couldn't justify the cost, the time it would take, and also the milk might spoil on the way. It had to stay fresh. What that meant was that dairy farms throughout central New York went belly up. They closed. When I was doing this work in the late 80s, you could drive through Shenango County for miles and see little more than the occasional trailer, house trailer here and there. The whole area had largely depopulated and had remained so for more than three quarters of a century. If you went into the woods, and there were lots of woods, this all this area used to be all open, it was all pasture land. In the late 1980s, it was all forested. If you went into the woods, you could be walking along and all of a sudden see what's clearly an erosion gully. And you look at it, you go, in the middle of the woods, why the hell do we have an erosional gully? And the reason being because nearly a century earlier, it wasn't the woods, it was open pasture land. And so the use of pasture has preserved, it's left an imprint on the landscape in those erosional gullies. But the upshot of all this is, is that the railroads doing what they did, using local families as their, their way in, because again, those local families bought up all these cheese factories, they controlled them. It was easy for the railroad to come in, buy them out. They basically put a lot of people out of work and a lot of uh, central New York were uh, depopulated. A lot of those folks either moved to uh, big cities or they moved west, the upper Midwest and beyond uh, to continue in farming. But it had the action of these corporations had an incredible effect on an entire population. Well, Jim, where were people getting their cheese then? Uh, this image right here shows you that. <laughs> For, well, this happens to be a condensed milk uh, uh, factory, which they, they were becoming popular around uh, the Civil War because it was a way of preserving milk in cans that could then be shipped. You don't have to worry about it spoiling. But there were similar factories too here and there that uh, produced cheese, but on a much larger scale, okay. industrial scale. Okay. And one of the ramifications for, you know, certainly for us as consumers is that, you know, you go to the store now and you buy in wrapped in plastic a block of, you know, craft cheese or whatever. And you can buy as many as you want and taste all of them and they all taste the same. They're all manufactured under very strict conditions. Prior to these large scale factories, and we had just had small factories all over the place, there were subtle differences in cheeses that you could taste. Much like if you go to the UK today and go to any town, they have their own brewery, they make their own beer, and you, you can travel around certainly England and Scotland and just by just sampling the beers from one, one pub in, in one community to the next, because then they're all a little bit different. And that was true of cheeses too. Um, there are subtle differences because the soils are different, means the grass is different, uh, different breeds of cattle perhaps, uh, different recipes for making this stuff. So each area had its own kind of, you know, particular taste to it. Um, one of the advantages to it though is that with these bigger factories, a lot of them started taking that way, which normally would have been just dumped or fed to pigs. And they, uh, capitalizing on the large Italian immigration to uh, the United States, started making regatta. Uh, and um, they were also making a variety of um, uh, soft cheeses like, you know, Neufchatel and, and what have you. Uh, and a lot, a lot less of that way wound up in local streams. Uh, 
Uh, in more recent years, a lot of that whey was dried, was dehydrated, and was used as a filler in foods. You can look at a lot of stuff, you know, processed foods you buy today, a lot of it has whey in it. And if you've ever drank, uh, ever had Ovaltine, Ovaltine is just dairy whey. <laughs> It's dairy whey with cocoa powder in it. Uh, not recommended for lactose intolerant people. It'll kill you. Uh, but a lot of foods do have dehydrated whey in it. It's a good source of protein, also lactose. Um, and so that, that is a benefit. But it certainly didn't benefit most of the people in central New York. So here are those factories again in 1899, New York cheese factories. And this is that same image a half a century later. And most of the factories you see here, which probably number, I don't know, 150 at most, uh, they're bigger places, as opposed to all these little places here that are producing, I don't know, 100 to 200 tons of cheese a year each. But you notice they still, you know, it's still the major dairy areas where you found those in 1899. And that's kind of true for the big factories in mid 20th century, Western New York, Central New York, and up in the Northern part of the state. Very little down along the Hudson. Actually, the lower Hudson was mostly known for butter making. Orange County um, is in the Southern tier was internationally renowned for the butter. And in fact, butter making, uh, we still see uh, in, in mid 20th century was still pretty widely dispersed because it didn't require a lot of capital. I mean, all, all you do to make butter is just skim off the cream, you know, and then beat the hell out of it until it, until it forms up. And you end up again with some whey, which you drain off, but you, that's, that's how you make butter. Uh, and so it's low capital and it also doesn't preserve quite as well. Uh, could have done another talk just on butter making. Uh, butter in the mid 19th century was usually mixed, well, was always mixed with salt. The salt was what preserved it for shipping any kind of distance. And we continued to add salt to butter even after we developed refrigeration. I go into a supermarket and just looking at what's available in terms of butter, you see big shelf loads of salted butter and above it, you'll see a much smaller area of unsalted butter. And it shows you that consumers still buy mostly salted butter, even though you no longer need to. The salt was put in as a preservative. You could buy unsalted butter, taste fresher, and if you want salt on you add your own as much as you want. But we've continued that tradition of salted butter, even though it's no longer really necessary. All right, and so to kind of wrap it up in, in terms of you know, where this gets us, why it's important. In 1887, the federal government created the Interstate Commerce Commission. And the ICC was formed to, to regulate railroads because the abuse was so widespread. You know, the closing of cheese factories and charging excessive rates to farmers to ship their milk was only one of, of many indiscretions. Uh, and also railroads would discriminate. They'd give certain rates to certain people and higher rates to others, depending on what, what it was they were trying to achieve in that particular area. Uh, Congress eventually extended uh, what the ICC was responsible for covering what we call common carriers, which is not just trucks and buses and railroads, but also telephone and uh, telegraph. Uh, Congress expanded that authority in 1906. In 1995, we shut them down as part of this oh, decade plus effort to reduce regulation and get rid of uh, federal agencies. And, you know, I can't tell you whether or not the ICC was still relevant in 1995, but I can say that that agency existed for a reason, and it was a really good reason. Unfortunately for the people of central New York and other parts of the country, including the upper Midwest and New England, Pennsylvania, um, it came too late. In terms of the cheese, in, you know, cheese making industry, uh, they were already beginning to decline rapidly because of what the railroads were doing. So um, I think this is a, this, this, the cheese factory, the archaeology of cheese isn't you know, really a joke. It really is a way of looking at um, rural development 
in, in our past and looking at how a number of different factors come together and some of it manifested in politics and in uh, regulation. Uh, but again, if you draw, I haven't been up there in years, but if you drive through Shenango County and large parts of central New York, these are areas that were almost entirely deforested uh, for the dairy industry. And now they're largely forested and the population density has dropped incredibly. And the ability of individual farm households to operate their own farming business and make a nice living, uh, basically over. So I think that's all I had. Yeah, that's it. So I'll take any questions you may have. Let me unshare this. Um, I'm muted. I have a couple in the chat, Jim, and then we can open it up to anybody that wants to ask a question. Okay. Um, do you have any idea why the whey wasn't fed to pigs or other farm animals rather than just dumped? Well, that's a really interesting question, and it wasn't just dumped um, uh, all the time. There, we do have, we, we uh, actually found a number of instances where uh, they established pigsties next to cheese factories. But as I mentioned earlier, that's not that good of an idea. Nobody wants their cheddar cheese smelling like pig manure. Um, what a lot of factories did was they also offered farmers um, the way which they could bring back to their own farms and feed their own pigs. Um, and they would get, you know, how much whey you collect was proportional to how much milk you brought. But I, I find it highly unlikely that most farmers brought back more than a little bit of whey. A little bit, a little whey goes a long way, if you will, to coin a phrase. Um, and, and it was it's bulky, you know, it takes a lot to, to cart that stuff around and, and it starts stinking too. So there were efforts and we, we've seen published instances of it, but by and large, it was just dumped. Okay. Um, was the cure area at a lower elevation for temperature? What they were doing, what we what we saw, it's it's not as far as I know, elevation doesn't have a lot to do with it. Um, although I suppose putting it up mm -hmm. higher, you know, having a higher building with multiple stories and putting them upstairs probably isn't that great of an idea because it'd be warm up there. Um, well, what we found at the Columbus Center Cheese Factory is, you remember I showed you a picture of the foundation and then all the rock rubble fill within. That was done, I think, to help um, moderate the temperature, keep it from fluctuating too much because stone uh, will give off, will, will absorb and release heat more slowly than soil would. Also, it helps keep the dust down. So there would be a wooden floor above that. But that stone was put in there for a reason. I mean, they could have just used earth, but they used rock. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that it had to do with regulating temperature and minimizing the amount of dust that would come up through the floorboards. Okay. Uh, why did you choose the Chenango County Columbus for this project? project? Well, I was working at, uh, I was a graduate student at the uh, uh, Binghamton University for the state of New York system. Um, now we had a contract branch to the department called the Public Archaeology Facility. And they used to do contract work and hire students to do the work. It was a way of getting work experience. We not only did the grunt work, but a graduate student would run the facility, actually run the business. Uh, we had a contract to the New York State Museum that handled all the New York Department of Transportation projects. So up in Columbus, there was a curved road that people had a habit of driving off of drunk and killing themselves. And the New York State Department of Transportation reasoned that if they straightened out the road, people would stop running off the road and killing themselves. I, I don't think it worked at all. I mean, the problem was mostly people were drunk, not that the road was curved. Anyway, uh, in order to take out that curve, they were going to impact an area where we knew there was a cheese factory. Uh, we knew that because the state of New York required the Department of Transportation to determine if any archeological sites would be affected by any of its construction projects. 
So this wound up uh, in, in our office and we went out. Uh, I wasn't part of the project at the time. We sent out a team that did some uh, archeological reconnaissance and found the remains of what they thought was the cheese factory. It showed up on 1875 maps. So it was pretty clear what it was. And then we had to go back and do additional work, basically collect, collect data uh, collect as much information as we could before the site was destroyed, and that's where I got involved. Okay, how did you know the pipe was for whey and not septic? There would not be any kind of septic in a cheese factory. There, in fact, actually, it's, it raises an interesting question: Where's the outhouse? Because you know, when you got to go, you got to go. So it's got to be. It must be. Some, it must have been some sort of facility around there, but it would not have been within the cheese factory. Um, also, you know, at that time, we're not talking about, in, you know, interior plumbing, just having a pipe like that isn't going to do, you'd have to have a fair amount of water running through it. And there was just no evidence of interior plumbing. Uh, it, 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 it was for way. Uh, okay. I can't see any other explanation for it. But, you know, if we had more time, it would be interesting to do a more extensive excavation. Uh, we didn't see any evidence of a pigsty, and we had no archival evidence of it, but it would have been nice to look. Uh, we didn't find any privies. There had to be one around there somewhere. It would have been nice to look. Um, but, you know, there are limits to what you can do. So in theory, if one of these cheese factories was um, built and it wasn't near a creek, they would have to build kind of a runoff gully area where the way could go in the dirt? They would have to be near water. You need a fair supply of water to keep the place clean. So I suppose you could do that with deeply dug wells, although... <laughs> This is central New York. You don't go down very far before you hit bedrock. Um, you know, digging wells is kind of tough. Uh, so typically they were near streams and it's not like there's any dearth of streams in central New York. It's a well-watered place by and large. Okay. Um, but well, you need is some elevation. It doesn't have to be, you know, a creek. You just need to get the way away from the building. Uh, was the foundation stonework mortared together? No, it wasn't, and that's not unusual up in that area. You get enough stone, uh, and it's all multifaceted stone. It's not rounded boulders. Uh, it fits together quite nicely. It, it, it's what's called dry laid, needn't be mortared. And the, the thing is, you know, it's just supporting the building. It's, it's the framing that's really important. And a cheese factory is not like a mill. It doesn't generate a lot of vibration, so it doesn't require the same kind of footing. Uh, but in that part of central New York, Stone's not hard to come by. I know I've broken a few shovels on it. Yeah, and one of the interesting things I noted in that one map you had from, I guess it was the 1850s, 1860s, showing the density of uh, farm cheese production, really outlines nicely the Tug Plateau area up there, mm -hmm. which was not a very good area for uh, production. It just yeah. seemed interesting that you could really see that outline there. Yeah, the Tug Plateau was depopulated fairly early on, and yeah. state of New York got some real deals on land up there. Well, I'm not sure what we did with it. Uh, uh, I think it's just mostly open open land, part of the Adirondack Preserve now. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of you know when I was working on this um, cheese factory, we we drive up in this uh, van. We called it Lurch. Uh, we'll let you figure out why. Um, and it was a good hour north of, of the university. And we would drive by this farm where they had an octagonal farmhouse. And it was advertised for sale. It had, I don't know, 50 acres. It was an 1850 house. It looked like it was in beautiful condition. Even taking into account prices have risen since. It was gone for like 30, it, it was offered for sale for $30,000 and didn't sell. You can get some real deals on land in central New York, at least in the late 1980s, because nobody wanted it. It wasn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. Farming was pretty much dead. No industry, unless you're near one of the cities. Um, you can get some nice real estate if you can figure out a way of making a living up yeah. there. And um, there still is some cheese production up there in the, the Herkimer area. Mm -hmm. um, continues to maintain the, the tradition, but I think it's more commercial than yeah, it is uh, farm based or you know local based. We've got we, in uh, New York. There's a lot of you tend to get these local manifestations of, for instance, Crowley's is a big dairy operation. Yeah, and they would have a good sized facility in most of the major 
cities, you know, producing milk, cottage cheese, and that that sort of stuff for the local market. But it, I mean, it's not the same. It's you know these multinational firms, and you know the the product is very stereotyped. You can buy a product in Western New York, Northern New York, Southern New York, Pennsylvania, and they will all taste the same if they're made from by the same yeah. company. Yeah, I think the Herkimer cheese is still pretty much a, a very local, sharp flavor, which is pretty yeah. good. My um. I actually was able to, uh, uh, a friend's father worked in the cheese industry, a later manifestation of it up until the 1970s when they got shut down because of the Clean Water Act. Um, and they used to make uh, mozzarella. Hmm. And he told me, you know, those guys over at Palio, they make this mozzarella with more than 4% butterfat. And he could not figure out how they were able to work the curds with that much butterfat, it'd be very tough. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is a guy who was in the industry and recognized, you know, the differences and uh, what you can do. The place he worked for was called, I think, City Cable. Which is a big, big, you know, international corporation that was not about, you know, you can tell from the name, Cable. Yeah, it had yeah. nothing to do with making cheese. Uh, but yeah, I picked up little bits of information from people who worked in the industry in the later years. It was highly industrialized. So do you think it was just in New York that these cheese factories were built? No, no, it was big. At, well, you know, cheese state, Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, but Vermont, you know, all of New England through the upper Midwest, cheese was big. And even today, you go to Wisconsin, you know, you know, uh, you know, if they built a statue to anything, it'd be to the cheese curd. Uh, curds and whey is still big in that area. Uh, it, it was all over, but they all had, it was all, they all suffered from the same monopolization that was typical in the post-Civil War era. And that really led to the progressive era uh, from the 1890s up until World War I. Progressive politics were very big. Uh, that's where we get the Food and Drug Act, you know, where we get the Food and Drug Administration. We had all sorts of antitrust laws, and all that grew out of the abuses of post-Civil War industrialized America. It's interesting. Did you have a hard time getting your research done? Like you were able to do the excavation, but did you have a hard time finding the book backup, the factual backup? Um, one of the advantages to going to school at Binghamton University, uh, well, two things. One, we're really close to Cornell University, but it's the part with the big uh, School of Agriculture. It had a great library. So I spent many hours just cruising the stacks and looking for interesting stuff and found some really fabulous material that would have been hard to find even with the computer system today. Um, and also Binghamton had interlibrary loan and was able to order all kinds of stuff from the, uh, what is it, the it's by a, um, a lending library in Chicago uh, that just loaned to other libraries. So I was able to get all sorts of trade journals and whatnot from the 19th century. So no, it was actually a lot of fun, uh, it took a while. Um, that's why we did the report fairly quickly after finishing the work, but the publication was several years before uh, we actually published something in an academic journal. Well, it's nice to be able to see those charts, you know, to see the factual information. Oh, those are simple charts. You should see some of the data we have. It's really quite, right, I think I've seen some manifestations of it. It's pretty, uh, we use some fairly sophisticated statistical techniques. Great. Mostly it's looking at with the follow-up journal article on the effects of the industry on farms, local farms. Well, that um, kind of ties in with this question. It just popped up. Sorry if I missed it, but why didn't the dairy farmers start making cheese? Was it too expensive to start up a new business? That's again, relates to the abuses of uh, the railroad magnates. You can make anything you want. You still had to get it to market. And that meant putting it on a train. You couldn't load up a wagon load of cheese wheels and cart it from central New York down to New York City. That simply wasn't practical. Uh, the railroads really monopolized transportation. 
and they would simply charge huge rates. I mean, people tried that. I mean, they tried different things, but they would be hit with rate discrimination and where it was no longer feasible to ship product anywhere uh, except what the railroad controlled. So, uh, you know, people did, you know, some people made, made managed to make a living. And New York, Central New York State, isn't totally depopulated, uh, but it greatly reduced the population, and also greatly reduced the opportunities people had to make a living and work for themselves. Why did the railroad care whether somebody was shipping cheese? Money. They, they wanted to control make... it because uh, I mean the railroads were a huge milk cow, if you will. Uh, the railroad magnates made huge fortunes uh, by controlling transportation and charging people whatever they wanted. Uh, they were making money hand over fist. And you know, some of the great names in American finance, uh, if they weren't railroad people, they were certainly involved in railroads. And it was a very small group of men amassing huge fortunes. And they did that by basically cheating rural folks out of their money. You know, they put in all the work producing something. All the railroads had to do was transport it. And they were taking uh, ridiculously large profits out of it. Okay, here's one more. Did you, did you go to the Columbus Hotel at the T in Columbus? And is there any remaining foundations that can be seen from the cheese factory? Well, I haven't been back since. I imagine that the road was eventually straightened and so it would have gone right through the site. I don't remember the town itself very much. I mean, I was, I was up there to sightsee. I was up there to dig. Um, so uh, you know, I, I, we drove through town a couple of times, but we didn't spend any real time there. And, so you haven't you know, been back since then? No, I haven't been back. So, you know, whenever we did this was probably 87, 88. You know, it would have been 86, 87. And um, we didn't spend that much time up there. Uh, we did all this probably in about two weeks, I'd say. Um, would have been nice to spend some time up there. To tell you the truth, a lot of the folks weren't that friendly. Because, uh, you know, we get these folks, you know, a couple of guys driving by in their pickup truck. And, you know, why, why is the government wasting money on this sort of stuff? And, and then we'd find out that they actually both worked for the town uh, doing road work. So they're, you know, basically on a public dole just as much as we were. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and like I said, our you know, town historian who should have had a great deal of interest in what we were doing was very reticent to share. That, that, I find that very interesting. And did she ask you to give her your report when you were finished? Did she say, I want to see what you write or anything? We, we offered right up front. We always do that even today. I mean, that's just, you know, we're happy to share these uh, reports with folks so that, you know, it gets a little bit out of it. Uh, but that, uh, you know, that didn't do it. And as I said, getting the diary from her took several years afterwards too. She knew about it. And, you know, it's one thing to say, well, I have this stuff, but I'm not willing to share it because I'm working on it right now. Mm -hmm. She said she didn't have it. She didn't know the stuff. She didn't know anything about the cheese factory. Wow. And that's, um, but that, that's not unusual. I've run into that a lot uh, over the years uh, in Maryland too. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, I think we have all the questions that have been typed up in the chat. Does anybody else have anything that they would like to ask Jim before we sign off? Jim, I think that might be everything. I, I wanted to let everybody know we also have another program with you next, um, well, next month in May, which is coming up very quickly. May 24th, we have a program called Run of the Mill. And that will be a Monday evening at seven o'clock. And I will include the registration link for that when I send, up, send out the follow-up email for this program. So um, if, in, if no one else has any questions, I guess we'll wrap it up. The mill, right. the mill talk will focus on Maryland. Oh, um, great. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jim. This was, as always, this was very informative.